All right. So as I said, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, population genomic screening webinar. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank my colleagues in the Division of Genomic Medicine, Alana and Terry, as well as Diana from the Grant Management Office and Rudy from the Review Branch. I will start with the, an overview, the purpose of the NOFO, an overview of uh, uh, including background, objectives, network organization. I will um, mention some important dates and then we'll have time for Q&A. All right, so the purpose of this initiative is to form a network to implement a pilot program uh, of population genomic screening for common actionable genomic condition in primary care setting. The program will evaluate uh, primary care based screening for roughly four to seven genomic conditions with the strongest evidence for effectiveness of screening in preventing disease or reducing its severity. The focus is on the CDC tier one conditions, uh, including the hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, Lynch syndrome, and the familiar hypercholesterolemia, along with condition with a strong, but perhaps not yet convincing evidence base, such as um, HFE, ATTR, and APOL1. The program will also use established strategy for meaningful community engagement in all phases of the design, of the conduct, and the evaluation. And lastly, we'll develop effective strategies for connecting patients found to have genomic risk variants to follow up care. Despite screening for tier one condition has been established, yet most patients remain unaware or unable to take preventive treatment actions. Primary care providers or PCP are the front line for disease prevention and management over lifespan. Introducing gradually through high value, high evidence condition relevant to primary care is most likely to be more success successful than adopting a very large number all at once, such as the current ACMG, for example, secondary finding list. With this initiative, we aim to address uh, several gaps. Despite the evidence uh, and some program existing, most individuals in tier one condition remain unaware, as I mentioned before, mainly because there is a limited adoption of genomic information by primary care clinicians. Uh, many feel poorly prepared despite approaches and resources exist. Gaps for this workforce include knowledge, confidence, evidence, uh, efficient workflow, and a robust informatics infrastructure to support decision making. And bridging these gaps, it's possible by facilitating the collaboration between the PCP and expert clinical centers. Also, because there is a limited uptake of genomic screening in healthcare setting by individuals. Limited con condition of coordination, I'm sorry, of follow-up care for individuals with identified tier one condition. And lastly, there is a need for co-development of programs with uh, PCP and, in, and individuals from all backgrounds. Here I have listed the objectives of this uh, uh, initiative. First of all, uh, the need of offering the test. Genetic testing should be available to all patients, regardless of health status and other conditions, without preferentially selecting for or excluding anyone who might be at risk. Engage the community relevant to the test offer. Established strategies for meaningful engagement in all phases should be used. Three, enroll 5,000 patients per clinical group in a 12 month period. Four, perform all exome sequencing or other approaches decided by the network in the first year. Perform all exome sequencing for variant interpretation, quality control and monitoring, generation of clinical reports, and submission of genomic data to the coordinating center and the clinical groups. 
by return results, return genetic testing results to the PCPs and the patients. Results return may occur from through electronic clinical decision support incorporated in the EHR where available or through other means where not available. Six, implement referral and a minimum minimum 24 months follow up for out outcome data starting from results return to patients. Develop effective strategies for connected individuals with positive uh, genetic risk with the appropriate follow-up care. Last, share lessons learned and successful approaches. Results from this pilot program will be used to refine broader population genomic screening program that might include an expanded number of conditions down the road, um, screening settings or implementation strategies. This is a summary of the program structure. We are envisioning we are going to fund this over five years. We issues three NOFL. We are planning to award one sequencing center, one coordinating center, and four to five clinical groups. The project plan is year one, focusing on the, 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 to determine the additional conditions to be included in the screening program and finalize the protocol. Year two, recruitment of 5,000 individuals per clinical group and perform most of uh, um, the all exome sequencing. Year three and five, finishing up the all exome sequencing and continue to return results, coordinate follow-up, collect follow-up data, and develop and disseminate best practices. At the bottom here, I uh, summarize the funding. If you have any question about this, please reach out. Now, important dates. The open date early submission is November 1st. It's also the deadline for you to send an intent, the letter of intent. Now, the letter of intent is optional but it really helped us to prepare for review panel in terms of the number of applications to expect. So even if you send me an email to say, I'm planning to submit an application, that would be okay. Just let us know if you are planning to come in with an application. Application deadline is December 2nd. Then we have review in February, March of 2025, and we are planning to award this uh, grants at the beginning of July 2025. Now, I'm going to go through questions and answers. Uh, I have included here some of the most frequent questions that I received. I received many questions from many of you. I believe I was able to return uh, to answer your questions. Um, through email. If I missed you, please reach out, let me know, and I'll be more than happy to, um, to do so, to answer your questions. Also, we are, after this uh, um, webinar, we are going to post these questions on the uh, web page where you register. Um, but since there are many questions, I'm not going to be able to go through all of them now, but you will see them um, after the webinar. All right, let's go through some of the questions I received. Can the clinical group applicants propose to work with a different sequencing laboratory, perhaps one with which they have prior relationship instead of using the sequencing center? The answer is no. For reason of standardization, logistic, and cost, the clinical group will be expected to work with the sequencing center any laboratory that can meet the requirement of the sequencing um, center RFA is welcome to apply. Do sample need to be blood or saliva? The type of collection method, method will be decided by the network during the first year. For budget purposes, applicants should try to use the most economical approach and determine your flexibility and demonstrate your flexibility in being able to use network agree protocol should they be different. Do the clinical groups need to, to budget for collection kits? 
No, the sequencing center will provide the kits and the clinical group should not budget for them. We already have integrated processes and clinical decision support for returning results in our system. Do we have to create new processes to apply for this opportunity? The answer is not necessarily. All our D will be expected to follow agree upon nectar protocols for returning the results, which could include adaptation of existing processes and CDS if agreed by the network. Applicants are welcome to leverage, leverage their existing processes and infrastructure for collecting the necessary data, but must demonstrate their procedures are consistent with the agree upon protocols. Protocol. The RFA states that the protocol development will take place in year one. Are then the clinical groups required to propose a plan in the research strategies? Yes, please. You have to include the research strategy plan. Clinical group, uh, clinical group applicants are expected to propose a plan. Successful applicant will then work with the funded site during the first year to finalize the protocol that works at all sites. Are clinical groups allowed to recommend more than four additional conditions for consideration in the population screening program? Yes, clinical groups may choose to suggest more conditions, but they must fit all the information needed by reviewers to evaluate them within the limited space permitted in the application. The network will agree collectively on the specific test for the specific variant to be screened based on the condition proposed by the successful applicants. For budgeting purposes, clinical group applicants should assume only three additional conditions should be could, um, condition to be screened and follow up to ensure com comparable staffing and funding across the sites. Would interesting industry partnership be allowed for the sequencing center? Yes, small businesses and for-profit organizations are not excluded from the eligibility cr criteria. However, we have not um, um, included foreign component or foreign uh, organizations. Will there be a common data management plan for the whole network or will each site develop their own? Each applicant will have to propose a data management and sharing plan in their application. You have to, this, is a, uh, this plan, the, D, the DMS plan will be reviewed by the study section as well as uh, NHGRI staff for, for compliance with the NIH uh, DMS policy. And I put the link here. Will the network consider other approaches beside all exome sequencing? Yes, we actually included some flexibility in the NOFOs to allow the use of other product, product beside all exome sequencing. The network will have the opportunity to discuss the best approach during the year one. The sequencing center NOFO include the expectation that applicants will be able to adjust to the network decision and provide a variety of sequencing approaches, such as target panel, all genome sequencing, or even long read sequencing. However, all exome sequencing should be used for budgeting purposes. The novel mentioned informed consent should be obtained for genomic and clinical information, future research use, and broad data sharing. Are then patients required to consent for all these elements and participate in the screening? Or is it possible for them to proceed with testing and receive results, even if they chose not to consent for future, future research and data sharing? Yes, um, uh, patients are uh, required to consent for all three elements. NIH expect that informed consent for future research use and broad data sharing will be obtained. If the applicants identify may, any reasons that may limit the extent of data sharing, they should describe it in their data management and sharing plan. And then NHGRI will then assess whether an applicant's DMS plan appropriately consider and describe these factors. Please look at these two um, links for more information. Last question. The NOFO calls for all exome sequencing to be utilized by the sequencing center. 
given that all exome sequencing uh, contains far more data than it's necessary for returning results, how will the data from all exome sequencing be managed? Will participants have the option to decline analysis and storage of the remaining uh, reminder of their exome data that is not relevant to the con condition of interest? No, participants will not have the option to decline analysis and storage of the unused data. And HGRI ex expect that secondary analysis of the all exome sequencing data will occur at some point. The network will decide when it will be best to return this data as NHGRI has been strongly urged to focus this pilot study on a small number of conditions. In other studies, Return of secondary funding has been done at the end of the study so as not to interfere with the goal of the program. We believe that if ex explained in the consent, this may work well. Also, community engagement can be used to decide on such items um, and during the first year of the program. Now, uh, thank you. Um, the uh, webinar is re will be it's recorded, so it will be available later on on NHGRI website. If you have questions, uh, additional question or um, question that I will not be able to answer today, or um, anything, just email me. Uh, we'll, as I said, we'll post the, the questions on the website. A website, and these are the um, RFAs for the clinical groups, coordinating center, and sequencing center. With this, we can stop the presentation and uh, um, take questions. So, Simona, we have some questions that have come in through the chat already. Um, so I'll just go down the list for you to be able to ask them or answer them. Um, and if you would like to, um, if you would like more information on your question, um, you can type in the, the Q&A and I'll have you come off mute. Or if you included your name, I'll call on you to come off mute if there's more to answer. Um, so the first one, Simona, is, is it okay to refer patients requiring counseling follow-up to doctors through program navigators, or do those services have to be offered within the project? No, I do refer patient requiring counseling follow-up to doctors through program navigators. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the terminology program navigators. So... Um, would you like to come off live and or come come off mute and and, and at, clarify your question, please? I mean, and this I said it says those or do those services have to be offered within the project? I'm not sure I understand here. I mean, I, I think we the um the follow up will have to um the follow-up will have to occur um, within the, the um, institution that they are at or wherever the PCP is recommending. So I'm not sure if I answer your question since I don't understand really what program navigators means. We can talk about this um, maybe through email. I wonder if they may mean that they have um, program navigators who are part of their health system or part of their clinic. Yeah, I mean, whatever it's uh, available and it's easy um, to use uh, for the um, patient will be okay. Uh, another question, and I, again, I'm just going down the list. Uh, can we submit a proposal for sequencing center alone, or should applications have all three centers? No, you can apply for one RFA only. You can apply only for the sequencing center, or for the coordinating center, or for the clinical groups. Okay. Another one asks... Um, if the uh, states of the NOFO lists an introduction to the application, um, could you offer guidance about what information should be in that section given the application is not a resubmission? You can, um, you know, it's not uh, required to have an introduction. So um, 
you you don't need to um, have that. And do, do clinical groups need to budget for the sequencing that will be done at the sequencing center? No, the sequencing center will be the one that we will award the money for the sequencing to be done. And that's where we set aside uh, the majority of the uh, funding in year two for the sequencing center, because we are expecting that majority of the sequencing is going to happen during that year, uh, but also a little bit in year three um, uh, for the sequencing. All right. Uh, and it looks like we have enabled the ability for um, people to unmute now. Apologies for that. Um, so you can also raise your hand. Um, and if I can see your raised hand, I will be able to call upon you. Um, another question. Um, oh, we answered that one. Can we get the certificate of attendance after the webinar? I don't think so. I don't think we we do that. Never heard. So, and Simone, I think you already answered this, but can the same institution apply for a cl clinical group and coordinating center? Yes, they can, as long as, uh, so here, just be aware that, um, th that the, uh, the PI from, for example, the clinical group cannot be the same PI for the coordinating center or the multiple PI. Uh, for the other NOFL. Um, you need to make sure that there is no overlap uh, and uh, and also it's not the best because they are very intense, um, um, you know, um, it, it is a, a, an important position. So, but they could be a co-investigators. All right, and should the clinical sites budget for Anvil computing or for secondary analysis? That's a good question. So secondary secondary analysis, uh, um, we haven't really talked about secondary analysis yet. Um, the focus of the RFA will be to do analysis of primary outcomes. So for secondary analysis, um, meaning looking at secondary um, outcomes um, might not be within the scope of this uh, RFA. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of questions about the community engagement. So how does the community engagement board get defined or established? And about the mentioning of the network-wide engagement activities should they also provide additional community engagement uh, that may be site specific? Right, so the expectation is that we will have a community engagement uh, board or patient advisory board uh, that will help the program to in all aspect of, uh, of it. And uh, um, it, it really uh, up to the network to decide how to implement this, but I can see the possibility of some sites maybe uh, having uh, um, experience in a certain area like breast cancer, for example. They already have a board or they know people that are on that board that could be br brought into this program as part of the PAB. So, um, it is possible that it is a site specific um, or that one site may volunteer to create the board um, uh, because has more expertise in that area. Uh, but at the end, it will be decided uh, during the first year by the, the STERI committee. Okay. We have a, a question about, is there a consensus gene list for the tier one conditions? Um, and then understanding that more genes will be added by the network as well. Okay. Is there a consensus gene list for, I think there is, I mean, CDC, I remember seeing that list. 
of uh, um, and uh, so we definitely um, can you go ahead Terry okay sure. might know better no you're absolutely right that there is currently a consensus gene list but the you know things evolve and and I think this is something that we would want the steering committee to address during protocol development yep and Another question, will FDA review or approval of return of results to participants be required? I do not think so, but Terry, you may want to, because you can see, I mean, they are already, you know, established, uh, right? Well, so so this is a changing area as well as as many people on the call know the the um, FDA is moving into um, um, approval of laboratory developed tests. The way the LDTs the the way that we have dealt with this in previous programs is when we're having a single lab, they do qualify as laboratory developed tests, and so they were outside of the FDA's purview. Whether that's going to change and how it will change, we really don't know right now. At present, I think we just want everybody to be aware that this is a possibility and it could cause some significant problems. But I think the, the only thing you can do is say, we're aware that this is a, a possibility and could cause significant problems and we'll deal with it, you know, but we don't know right now. And I'm gonna skip a second to another um, question on the genes. Will variants of uncertain significance be returned for the genes on the agreed upon panel and will impact uh, this because this will impact strategies yeah, for return most, results. Right, most likely not. Uh, but I think it will because you know they are of uncertain significance. But um, most likely we will discuss this the first year and decided whether some of them might be worth returning or not. And sticking with the genes really quickly, among the extra four to seven conditions, will all sites be expected to offer the same overall conditions? Or could that be influenced at the clinical group level? No, I think I, we need to have the same condition for one single reason. Think about um, each site is going to contribute with the, you know, the results to a bigger data set that will be collected and managed by the coordinating center. So results will be the analysis of the data set uh, will be done on, you know, the, 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 the big one that is um, uh, coming from each site. So the, the, I'm sorry, the, the the smaller, the contribution from each site will create the bigger data set and the analysis will be done on that data set. Therefore, we really need to have all sites focusing on the same um, conditions. Okay. I'm gonna skip back up to the first question. If a sequencing center application uses whole genome sequencing instead of whole exome sequencing within the same budget, would it be considered or seen as a negative? So I don't think so at this point, um, but if the cost of all genome sequencing is much higher than the cost of what the, the network decides to do, let's say panel or exome sequencing, then you, you know, that grant we might have additional fund to spend. What we will consider if that's the case is additional, you know, the following up years, we will adjust the, the awards based on the extra money that that site may have. Diana, tell me if that's something um, that is correct that we can do, right? having trouble coming off mute. Um, so we always look at the unobligated balance on grants to determine if they are needed in the future year. And if there were funds provided for one activity that's not gonna be done anymore, it's something we consider using to partially pay the next year as an offset. Right. Another question comes in, are we testing methods for uptake of screening or testing the validity of new tests? Similarly, are the outcomes being assessed, implementation of tools, efficacy of screening tools once given? 
Okay, so the primary outcome should be about the uptake of the screening, the um, implementation of the tool, the efficacy of, uh, of the tool implemented, uh, the uptake of, uh, um, of the screening by the patient, by the PCP. So um, if you look at uh, the RFA, there is a list of potential primary outcome that might be worth considering um, uh, for the goal of this RFA. Right, and that along those lines in the instructions for the clinical groups, NOFO, three specific aims are already given. Are those the specific aims that all clinical group applicants must include in their proposal? Yes. All right, and are there specific, Terry. oh, go ahead, Terry. Yeah, I'm sorry, I might just, I might just qualify just a bit. Um, those were, were objectives. Obviously, every applicant, successful applicant, will need to address those objectives. You can write your specific aim however you want to. As you know, you could have more or you could have fewer, but you've got to, you have to address those, those three goals. Okay. Right. And are there specific requirements for what clinical outcomes we yes. should assess over the 24 months? We already mentioned that. Look at the RFA. Is there an expectation that the research strategy of the application propose a randomized control trial that specifically evaluates the effectiveness of implementation strategies to recruit patients for genetic testing, ascertain samples, and follows patients for follow-up? If so, how will the network of funded sites determine the final procedures? Expectation that the research strategy of the application propose an RCT. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. This is really, we need to offer this to everybody. It's a population screening um, approach. And despite not being a randomized clinical trial, it's considered by NIH a clinical trial. So just be aware that the definition of clinical trial by NIH is not necessarily linked to the fact of whether or not it's a randomized clinical trial. Okay, another question um, says, we currently offer clinical tests for FH, Lynch, and HBOC across the county. Um, the challenge or main gap is insurance coverage, regardless that these conditions are on the CDC tier one. Um, I'm not so, sure what the question is there. Yeah, right. Um, what I can say is that um, assessing, for example, insurance coverage will be great to know, um, you know, um, is that the limiting factor why we are not implementing enough? Is it accurate that the sequencing center has no access to individual identifiers and clinical data? Is the coordinating center expected to do data cleaning that links clinical data with genetic data? Yes. So the clinical, the coordinating center will be linking the clinical data and the genomic data. So clinical data coming from the clinical groups as a workflow and the genomic data coming from the sequencing center. So the coordinating center will have to have a way to link those two to create the master data set. But, and, and again, Simona, in, in your yes answer, there were two questions there. So I think the answer to both was yes, um, in that they will not have individual, you know, identifying information, but there has to be, a, you know, a, an ID, a unique ID right. to link them. Yeah. This is more of a technical question, too. Is the one application by institution or laboratory group? Is the one application? Application by institutional laboratory group. I'm not sure I understand that. Uh, it's the in institution that usually there is an institution that will apply, and I within that institution they might have a laboratory group. So either part of the institution or as a subcontractor carried to you. Yes, yeah, so it'd be really helpful if the questioner would unmute and if they can and and clarify their question. But um, as Simona said, the institution is the applicant. Um, it may be what you're asking is 
you know, if you want to apply for both the sequencing center and the clinical groups, do you send in one application? No, you have to send in a separate application for each RFA. So I see a hand up and so you, can you call on Niall? Sorry, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, and this was actually relating to the prior question about the individual identifiers. I guess just to clarify on that one, my understanding of the sequencing center RFA is that the sequencing center is responsible for the interpretation and report generation. I, I think in, in general, geneticists signing out the report would want identifiable information on that report. We Most clinical labs would not want to put anonymized IDs on the on a report. So not not to be answered right now, but just to make a point, I guess that for for clinical reporting, most labs will want identi uh, individual identifiers. They don't need all the clinical data, but just the CLIA compliant identifiers. Okay. That's helpful. Thank yeah. you. Okay. And I'm trying to see, thought I saw another hand up, um, but it's down now. David Hansen, I think I saw your hand up. Is that you no longer need that? Well, that was an accident. I apologize. Okay. Um, and can awarded clinical groups use referrals to increase recruitment, or must all subjects be recruited by members listed in the award? Is this nationwide recruitment, or is recruitment limited to a specific region? Um. Um. My feeling for this is that for the first question, that we have to use that subject should be recruited by members of listed in the award. Uh, and that, uh, um, is it the nationwide recruitment or recruitment limited to a specific region? It's up to you. If you have clinical sites that are all over the country, that's okay. Um. This might might have been part of the prior question, um, and uh, you can come off mute or raise your hand if you need to. What part of the follow-up care is expected to be covered by the grant funding? Genetic counseling regarding the positive result, colonoscopy screening, mammography screening? Um, I don't think we are going to cover with this funding the colonoscopy screening or mammography. I think the Goal ends with the referral. Okay, and this is related to the original one about the program um, coordinators of wondering whether the program must provide treatment to patients who are determined to have one of the target conditions or the program can simply refer them yeah. to the appropriate specialist, which you also just answered. Uh, is there a timeline for returning the results to participants? Yeah, we said, uh, well, return. Oh, uh, I think we mentioned something in the RFA. I might be um, blanking on it. Um, remember that you have 24 months for follow-up. So the, the earliest you return results, the better. Uh, Terry, do you recall that? I, I do not. Um, please, please check the RFA to see if there's something in there, and then we'll we'll put something in the FAQ document that that clarifies this. So I thought I agree with you, Simona. I thought we had specified something, but again, mm -hmm. um, that can be a subject of of discussion, particularly when you're dealing with local communities that may not have the same capabilities. Uh, similarly, what is the expected turnaround uh, time, or what is what is the expected turnaround time expected for the se sequencing center to return results? Well, uh, um, I think we did specify that, Simona. Uh, don't remember, Terry. I don't think uh, yeah. I'm not we'll, sure we did. We'll, but... we'll look it up. We'll look it up and and provide an answer. Yeah. Is it expected that the conditions be selected will allow us to reach the four to five percent positivity rate noted in the RFA? Not necessarily. I mean, depends from what else we are going to decide decide on on in addition to the CDC tier one. What are the charges need to be included with the sequencing center budget? That's also in the 
uh, that's a very general <laughs> question. Uh, what are the charges? Well, think about what you are going to do and what you need to be, you know, um, you need to do the sequencing. You need to have uh, personnel doing the sequencing. Um, so you have to go through your processes and figure out what you need to charge um, in the budget to accomplish the goal of the RFA. Okay, um, are all clinical sites expect, uh, sorry, are all clinical sites sequencing the same conditions and following the same protocol for return yes. of results? Yes. Okay. Do you anticipate that the underrepresented minority populations you're trying to target in this opportunity will be comfortable giving consent for broad, undefined secondary use of sequence data? Patient engagement in our experience has shown that many URM populations want to know that their data will be used for, or what their data will be used for, and they often do not feel comfortable. So, um, so yes, we do anticipate that um, to uh, hopefully the underrepresented minority population uh, will be comfortable in sharing their uh, data broadly. Uh, I do believe that um, if we do this in the right way, we can, by engaging, for example, the uh, patient, um, like in, in the patient advisory board, um, and engage the community, they can really help us in tailoring the informed consent to request the um, sharing of uh, the data broadly. So um, I do think we have to have this discussion when uh, when we are preparing and when we will write the informed consent uh, by engaging the um, the community. It is our expectation to um, return um, the the data to the community uh, at large. Okay, I was trying to see if there was a similar question. Um, so we're just going to go with the next one. What can the infrastructure fund be used for within the grant? Okay, what can the infrastructure fund be used for within the grant? Oh, well, the infra we call it infrastructure, uh, but is, you know, whatever, like the first year is infrastructure cost. Uh, that means the PI that are going to participate in the um, in the uh, meetings to discuss the protocols, the people that are involved in the protocol, um, the the group of uh, uh, you know individuals that are needed to accomplish the goal of the first year. So um, we call it infrastructure, but it's basically what is the base for. Um, accomplishing the goal um, um, beside the cost, for example, of the sequencing. That is kind of separate. Um, hopefully this answered the question. I wouldn't be worried too much to justify what is infrastructure. Uh, and Let's see, we've got quite a, still quite a few questions here. Um, can you clarify the number of clinical sites allowed within each clinical group? The RFA comments on a limit so that the adequate number of patients requiring positive results return occur within each site, right. within each group. Right. Uh, I've been trying to talk back and forth with the... Um, this group about this. The, the bottom line is that we want to make um, the experience meaningful for the PCP that are involved in the study. So think about if uh, you have a PCP that is gonna see one case, is that going to be meaningful for that PCP? Is it gonna learn enough? So if we have a limited number of sites, clinical sites, and a, a, a limited number of PCP that are involved in the, in the, in the initiative, we are most likely and more likely be able to 
um, you know, give this PCP a more uh, meaningful experience. So, and also it depends from, you know, we estimated four to 5% of positive cases. So uh, that could be less if, uh, depending from the condition that we're gonna choose. So um, that's basically, so try to, to think about that limit on the site uh, taking into consideration the the reason why we want to limit that number of sites. Okay, and the next question I believe we've already answered related to the outline or the, the specific aims outlined in the mm -hmm. clinical group. Uh, Follow-up question on the um, answer to the ANVIL question earlier, um, who budgets for the cloud so, computing component? So, um, I think there should be some budget from the clinical groups about computing and Envil, just because if you think about down the road, the heavy lifting will be done by the coordinating center. The coordinating center will be responsible for depositing the data into Envil and to do the analysis of the data. Uh, but we will have to have uh, uh, the site also um, being able to um, work with the coordinating center on the analysis of the data, but not being their main focus. So um, you can imagine, you know, maybe dedicate um, X, you know, percentage of time of uh, uh, a statistician to um, to work on the statistical analysis at the end of the study with the coordinating center, um, but the uh, cost of of uh, you know um, envol should be mainly um, budgeted by the coordinating center. Can you budget for data egress, storage, and com? compute costs, pipeline development to do the variant calling and curation. So I believe uh, that, is that for the sequencing center? I think there are there there is a guidance uh, when I uh, in, that I included in the RFA that there is uh, uh, definitely if you look at the RFA there is definitely a link to the EMBOL um and to the um charges that are recommended um when taking when you know we are dealing with data and the envel so please look at that link in the rfa another question will the nih be prioritizing single site applicants or will they be are they welcoming collaborative regional projects did i understand that each clinical group will propose its own research trial, but the network will decide in concert in year one. Okay, so first question, will the NIH be prioritizing single site applicants? No, we are not going to prioritize either or. Um, I think that everything is welcome and collaborative and regional project are welcome as well as single site project are welcome. Um, the merit of those applications will be decided during a, a review. So um, that's uh, for that. Did I understand that each clinical group will propose its own research trial by the next? Yes. Well, it will not research trial, but they will propose the the um, conditions uh, that will be considered for additional screening on in addition to the CDC tier one conditions. And you will have to, you, if you, for example, are going to uh, propose th four additional conditions, um, you need to explain in your application, what is your research strategy uh, for those um, conditions, um, but not necessarily um, uh, you will, uh, be implementing those if there's the network decides not to decides to implement other types. So the flexibility of a clinical group in being able to implement 
um, a different condition than those uh, described in their own application should be addressed. It's very important that we know that you as a clinical group can implement other condition beside those that you are recommending. Okay, another sort of budget question. Can you clarify the budget for sequencing site? Application budgets are limited to no more than 350,000 per year direct cost infrastructure. Can we budget more than 350K per direct per year direct costs? The, the 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 max is three hundred and fifty k direct cost. So, um, you can budget um within that limit. Um, you cannot. And as I said, um, infrastructure is we use that word to include anything that is needed to perform the um the task. Uh, that are needed for you know accomplishing the the goal of the RFA. Yes, yeah, so, Simona. For the years that they're doing sequencing, they they have to increase their budget. It's got to be yeah, of course, of course. Right. Yes. So yes. you can budget more than three fifty for those years, but right. no more than three fifty for infrastructure. Exactly. Right. Will sequencing center return negative results? So um, I think we will have to discuss this within the story committee, but I do believe that if there is a negative result, that should be communicated to the site. And then the site um, um, will have the answer. And uh, as, a, as, as the story committee may decide to return that to the patient and to the um to the PCP uh it may be a easier form than if it was positive i think that it's up to the survey committee to decide but um i think the communication from the sequencing center to the clinical groups with the negative result should should be there should happen Okay, I'm gonna skip the next one, um, or Terry. Yeah, let me just just answer. This is referring to this question about you know um, the FDA, mm -hmm. and I, I was referring to the laboratory developed test because if it's an LVT, you don't need an investigational device exemption, um, and it all depends on how the LVT requirements evolve. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, confirming the coordinating center will need to work with each clinical group to obtain data for analysis. The sequencing center will return results to the clinical groups, correct? Yes, so the coordinating center will work with the clinical group to obtain the data for the analysis, yes. And the sequencing center will return results to the clinical groups, yes. They have to so that they are, the PCP can be informed and return the patient results. Terry. Although we, we have to keep in mind that the results are going to be a very small subset of the exome. Yeah, right. So so the data for the exome, it would be make much more sense to send that to the coordinating center directly. This is something that applicants can propose how they would suggest we do it. We'll decide in protocol development. All right, and this one is related to the community engagement. Do I understand correctly that each applicant for the community, the clinical groups will come up with their own plan for community engagement, recruitment strategies, and the research trial and the genomes tested, but the selected groups will all discuss in a network and in consensus have the same protocols and genes and research trials. Come up with their own plan for community. Yes, so the clinical group should come up with a plan for community engagement um, and recruitment strategies and, um, um, and you know, um, the research that needs to be done and the genomes to be tested. Um, um, and then during the first year, we will decide how to implement 
those uh, activities. Right, keeping in mind that the community engagement part may need to be tailored. I think we did talk about tailoring things in the RFA. So as much as possible, everybody does the same thing. Certainly there, there can be you know common co components of the community engagement, but exactly how that's done may have to be tailored somewhat as little as possible. All right, and we have four minutes and a number of questions remaining. I'm gonna go through a few easy ones or simple ones. I think. Um, is this a one-shot application opportunity? Will there be the possibility to reapply? No, there is no um, reapplying. This is one shot. And there's a couple on the additional conditions. Should we propose the additional conditions or just how they should be chosen? And to confirm the number of them, is it four to seven additional conditions or four to seven total? Total. Correct. So yes, the question to the, okay, so uh, can you, I can't see the question. Can you, rem the first question was? Should we propose the additional yes. conditions or just how they should be chosen? You should uh, propose the conditions um, and uh, um, how they should be, you can describe what your strategy will be for choosing the, con the, the condition to be implemented. And then the, it's the total up to seven. So it will be, um, you know, we have three conditions from CDC. And so you can propose additional up so that the total will be seven. Okay, clarification. Did you say that all of the ACMG reportable findings will be returned to participants at the end of the study? And if so, do we need to have a plan for dissemination of these secondary findings? If we decide to go with all exome sequencing or all genome sequencing, and we have additional information that uh, will not be returned, returned during the study, um, it is expected that we will return that at the end of the study. And uh, um, yes, you will. We will have to plan for dissemination of these secondary findings, and this is something that you know we will be discussing once we decide which approach to take. And, and I would just keep in mind that 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 the total number or proportion of people with the with um, actionable findings is only about three percent, and a huge proportion of those are in the CDC tier one findings already. It's one of the reasons they're tier one. So, so the number is going to be small. But Simona is right. You know, provide a plan for that dissemination. Okay. So we should um, stop, um, mm -hmm. uh, Simona, and then maybe you can just say how we'll deal with the unanswered questions. Absolutely. We have the questions in the chat. Uh, we will uh, respond to those questions and publish the answer on the web page where you register for the webinar. Uh, give us uh, probably by the beginning of next week, uh, we should have that. Today it's Thursday, Thursday. maybe Friday and Monday, and then maybe Tuesday or yeah. Wednesday next week. Sounds good, Terry? Or it's, to, uh, it's, you know, Monday's a holiday for oh, uh, Monday's several, a holiday. No, several um, people, yes. but we'll we'll do it as soon as we can. Certainly next week, sometime. Right. Well, thank you so much for um, participating, and please do not hesitate to contact me. I am here to help, and uh, um, looking forward to this initiative. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for now.